Hi, my name is Axel Barcelo. I will be the chair of this, this session. I am a Mexican philosopher from the, National from the National University of Mexico, where I work, um, among other things, on social ontology. And uh, it's, uh, I'm wearing, uh, I'm brown. I am a light brown, well, at least what counts as light brown in Mexico, a uh, 51-year-old uh, person with uh, mustache, glasses, and very black hair. I am wearing black headphones, a uh, green, olive green uh, linen shirt with a tie dyed tie in earth tones. And behind me is my bookshelf. No philosophy there, only art and literature and lots of comic books. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Jonathan Wolf. Uh, Jonathan Wolf uh, is the Alfred Landecker. I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, Alfred Landecker, Professor of Values and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government, Oxford, a political philosopher working especially on questions of injustice and disadvantage at the intersection of political philosophy and public policy, whose books include an introduction to political philosophy, which was first published in 1996, and it's in progress, the fourth edition. Disadvantage from 2007 with Afner de Chalit, and Ethics and Public Policy, which second edition is from 2019. Uh, his talk is entitled Musical Therapy, Autonomy and Equality, and the session will be 50 minutes in length. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Axel. And um, let me thank Shelley once again for um, not only putting this program together, but suggesting perhaps I might uh, talk as well. So um, I think a number of people in the conference have talked about how they got interested in the topic of disability. And you know, for many people, it was personal experience or family experience. Um, though in my case, I think it's rather different. It, uh, when I explain this, I often say it was out of a sense of embarrassment um, because I'm a political philosopher and I'm you know, trained in the analytic school, if one wants to call it that. And you know, I began as an undergraduate in 1980. And the great text, of course, at the time was John Rawls, The Theory of Justice. Uh, I still teach it now, but it was quite fresh. And when I was in graduate school, we attended also to Dworkin's two papers on equality that had come out in 1981. So this was really cutting edge work. Now Rawls, um, as many of you will know, says nothing about disability in a theory of justice. He deliberately leaves it on one side and he was criticized uh, for that. We could discuss whether that was a fair criticism or not. But Dworkin came along later and um, pointed out that Rawls had ignored the topic of disability and came up with a scheme to address disability. Uh, he used the language of handicapped then, but um, he came up with an idea of thinking about how social justice should deal with the topic of disability. And to put it briefly, he probably wouldn't agree with this way of putting it, but to summarize his view, uh, he conceives of people with disabilities as lacking a type of internal resource that other people have, and they should be given more external resource, more money to make up for the lack of internal resource. And so Dworkin sees the problem of disability largely in distributive terms. And the question is, you know, what is a correct level of redistribution from people who don't have disabilities to people who do? Now, I took that pretty much for granted. I hadn't worked on disability beforehand. And I can remember giving a talk about equality and very briefly describing Dworkin's position. And for some reason, I think it was an interdisciplinary conference. There was someone from disability studies in the room who told me that the Dworkin position was disgusting, retrograde, 
and did, and completely ignored every bit of progress there'd been in disability studies. And I was shocked because this was cutting edge political philosophy. And to be told that it was regressive, oppressive, was um, really, you know, it, it shook me up. So I thought I'd better read some work in disability studies, which I started doing, and this was a revelation. So um, from my point of naivety, it had not occurred to me that people with serious physical disabilities could be happy living with them and didn't want them cured in the hospital. It was, it just had not occurred to me that there was anything other than medical approaches. But reading disability studies and around about the same time, um, either Shelley or someone else sent me some of Shelley's early work criticizing Dworkin. I came to see how weak um, the philosophical work in my tradition was and thinking that we have to do better. Now, around about the same time, you know, I've been doing a lot of work on equality and I was taught Rawls, as I said, and Dworkin's work. Uh, I, I was taught this by a G.A. Cohen, who had been my teacher. And Cohen, of course, added to that debate. And there were regular seminars in, in London, UCL, where uh, I was a student and Cohen taught at that time, where we were trying to refine theories of equality. But my heart was never really in it. And it took me a long time to understand what I thought was wrong with the discourse. And largely the problem was that Cohen and Dworkin and others conceived equality in distributive terms. So an equal society is one, as Cohen puts it, that gives everyone an equal amount of something. And the idea is what is that thing? Is it happiness? Is it basic capabilities? Is it resources? Is it primary goods? So this was a question of the currency of egalitarian justice. What is this thing that we have to share out equally? Now, I was very uncomfortable with this because it seemed to me almost infantile to want to make sure there was this thing that was shared equally. And when I thought about what is it that attracted me to the idea of equality, it wasn't that I was attracted to the idea of equal shares of something, but rather I was attracted to the idea of living in a society of equals. And so for me, equality was about relations between individuals rather than a distribution of things. And so I started developing uh, my own version of relational equality or social equality. Other people had done very similar things before, David Miller, Richard Norman in the UK, Elizabeth Anderson, and Samuel Scheffler. But I'm very much on the side of thinking about equality in relational terms rather than distributional terms, although we can't ignore distribution. And in particular, I was um, very disturbed by the Dworkin, Cohen type approach to equality. And one reason for this does come from personal experience or, or family experience. And um, it concerned my mother. So my mother, um, when I was a teenager, worked as a receptionist for a local doctor in the small town that we lived in. And unfortunately, she contracted tuberculosis, TB, from one of the patients. She'd asked the doctor whether that she worked for whether she should have a vaccine, the, the, the jab against TB, and he said, no, no one gets it anymore. You don't need to bother. And then she caught it from one of the patients. And you know, she was uh, got it quite seriously and had to go to a sanatorium for a few months. When she came back, she... Well, first of all, she lost her job. There was no employment protection on health grounds in those days, but she couldn't work. And so she was given a disability allowance. But it was something that had to be renewed every year. And this was the important point that every year she had to show that she was still disabled and unable to work. And what that meant in this case was in the small town that we lived in, there'd be a visiting panel of doctors so three middle-aged men in suits, and they would hire a church hall, and they would have a sort of parade of people on disability allowance who would have to come in to prove they were still disabled. And in my mother's case, that meant apparently stripping naked and blowing into a bag to show that she had low lung capacity. 
And so in order to continue to get her few pounds a week disability allowance, she had to go through this humiliation. And what um, that made me realize is that the type of equality that Dworkin and others argued for, which makes people responsible for their choices, encourages this type of humiliating means testing. So I can't go into the argument here, but one of the reasons I, I rejected the, the Dworkin approach is that it makes victims of the people that it's trying to help. And that this seems to me very important. More particularly, and I will get to this shortly, um, the ways in which we try to help people, social policy tries to help people can be experienced as oppressive. So after I finished my work, first work on relational equality, I started working on disability. Uh, I went to conferences, mostly in the US, um, organized by Anita Silvers, Leslie Francis, uh, Lawrence Becker was involved. Uh, Lysia also was involved in many of these and uh, Eva Kitte. Uh, I went to both of the conferences that Eva wrote about in her famous paper against McMahon and Singer and contributed to that conference. And I wrote, I, I think I've published three papers on disability, but they were all published in the same year, even though they were written over a decade, because at that time it was quite hard to get work on disability published in mainstream journals, which is what I wanted to do. It's much easier now, there's growing interest in philosophy of disability among philosophers, um, but it tends to be rather similar in methodology in that, most of the philosophers who look at disability think they, they're going to be the first person that gets the definition of disability right. So they come in and they want to define disability and they, they pay a lot of attention to a minor variation to existing definitions and someone else comes along and refutes it and so on. So I don't find that work very fruitful. Um, this, one of the very few things I agree with Nietzsche on is that any concept with a history doesn't have a definition. And that if we're going to, when we use the term disability probably in different ways. And you know, many of the debates about definition are not very fruitful. I'm not saying none of them are, I think some are very important, but I, I think there are, the amount of time spent on the definitional question is, is rather unfortunate, given that um, there are so many ways in which people with disabilities are unjustly treated and I think our jobs should be about recovering and understanding the injustice and thinking about social policies that can improve the situation rather than spending too much time on um, definition. So I take what many people regard to be a rather a simplistic, naive understanding of disability. Uh, so I regard disability as a lack of fit between the person and the world in which that person lives and the lack of fit impedes that person's flourishing. This means that we can try to address disability in a number of different ways. Uh, the traditional way, the medical way, is to try to change the person. Um, the, we can also try to assist the person or you know, the preferred model would be to change the world. And this is where the social model of disability is so helpful and illuminating. And I should say my uh, acquaintance with the social model of disability has changed the whole way in which I do philosophy, not just around disability, but about around other topics as well. But the problem is that um, the social model of disability has its limits. Um, that we can change the world to help people with physical disabilities, but not all physical disabilities. There are certain things like pain, like um, chronic depression, for example, where we don't really know how to change the world. And particularly around what's often called cognitive disability, the social model struggles a bit more. Now, cognitive disability itself is a term which is not enormously helpful because there are many ways in which people can have some form of mental disability, which is not a cognitive disability. So as a working name, I have tended to use the term um, from Thomas Schramm, which is minority minds rather than cognitive disability, 
Now, I know that some people don't like that expression. Perhaps we could talk about it. But it, as a generic expression, I, I will use that term, minority minds. And many people with minority minds, um, we, we've run to the limits of our imagination in trying to apply the social model. And the best we can do is to try to find ways of helping the person to flourish. And there are going to be various ways in which that might be possible. Now, um, a few years ago, I was asked to give a talk at a conference on uh, relational equality and relational autonomy, which is something I hadn't worked on before. Uh, Kristen Voigt and Natalie Stoljar had noticed there are these two separate literatures developing about relational equality and relational autonomy, and had the idea of trying to put the two things together and invited me as someone who'd written about relational equality. So I agreed to give a talk, but I wasn't sure what I was going to say. But at the same time, um, I had become very impressed with the work that a friend of mine called John Hall had been doing. Now, John Hall, um, in his early days, had been a professional pop musician. Then he became a record producer, a successful record producer. Then he retrained as a musical therapist. And he works with people with complex mental health problems, adults and children, teenagers. And what he does is take people who may or may not have had believed to have had any musical ability and gets them to write, record, produce songs to quite a high professional standard. And I, I went to see some of his work and um, I went to a performance. I'm going to show you a video in, in 30 seconds or so, but I just want to say what the context of this video is. So he was asked to uh, run a program with the children's hospital in Manchester, working with the children on the inpatient ward of the mental health uh, facility. So these are teenage, he's working with teenage inpatient mental health patients, uh, teenagers. Um, as it turns out, many of them are uh, people with severe eating disorders, life-threatening eating disorders. And he was asked to come in and run his program with them. And I'm going to show you a two minute video, which shows what he's doing. So Jamie, if we can play the video now, that would be fantastic. I keep the sunshine in my shoes And forget about the blues It's driving me insane Feeling hopeless every day On a reach up to the stars Shoot a rocket up to Mars We're only just for one day myself again would i remember you there's a feeling inside that i can't explain something inside and i miss you i got nothing to say but all the same and there's a feeling inside and i miss you Every day of my life, every step of the way, you've always been there to hold me. When I hear your voice, it lights up my life. When I see your face, I'm not lonely. You hold me up when I'm down, and you can always bring me around You Hold me up when I'm down And you Can always bring me around It must have been hard With so much to do 
But you went through the struggle and you raised me And all I can say If it's all the same I'm sorry and I thank you So I hope you get the idea of that. So the the way that John works with young people is he, um, he he's he's got a very personal manner. He uh, and gets talking to, to them, gets them to talk about you know, their musical likes and dislikes, and sits them down at the piano and gets them just to play on the um, white notes to begin on on the um, black notes to begin with. And if you know anything about music, if you sit at the piano and play on the black notes, it sounds okay pretty much whatever you play. And this gets people the confidence to start thinking about they may have some talent and he gets them talking and gets people to write lyrics about their life. That film was uh, quite an emotional experience for many people involved with it. I was there at that performance and the boy uh, Jack, whose music was played, his mother was there, and she had no idea that he had done this. So, it, as you can imagine, um, there were strong emotions in the room. So, um, what can we say about this? What should we say about this? Well, the first thing that I thought was that, so I'd heard about this before I went to the performance, and uh, my wife and some other friends had been to performance of adults. And what you saw with people who were obviously very disturbed coming in, very withdrawn, very quiet, suddenly getting up on stage and singing a song. And their families had no idea very often that they were capable of doing this, that something had been brought out of them. It was obviously them, um, but it was something beyond the experience of those around them. So how can we think about this in terms of autonomy, you know, which, which is the you know, one of the philosophical interests and many other philosophical interests as well, too, of course. So the way for me into this is that thinking about autonomy, maybe just within the tradition of analytic philosophy, before we even get to feminist theories of relational autonomy, there's the old fashioned distinction between negative liberty and positive li liberty. And something that I attribute to Charles Taylor, which made a deep impression on me, which is the idea that you don't make people free by leaving them alone. That in order to make people free, they need interaction with others in some ways. So relational autonomy is the idea, many of you will know, it's been used very much in feminist philosophy, that we're embedded uh, human beings, our identity, and even our freedom depends on our relations with others. This is developed in very many different ways. But the two things I want to pick out, one is the development, developmental notion of autonomy, the idea that you don't develop autonomy on your own, that you, we don't make people autonomous by leaving them on their own, that people need to be helped. But secondly, whether autonomy itself, the expression of autonomy requires relationship. So there's a, an old fashioned idea of autonomy where autonomy is about independence, giving people the wings to fly on their own. But is that really the best way of thinking about autonomy? Perhaps people need to be supported in their decision making in order to be autonomous, at least some people on some occasions. Because what we're seeing in the music therapy is something which is authentically within a person that the music therapist is bringing things out. He's not putting his judgment, he's not substituting his judgment for other people's judgment, he's supporting people. But at the same time, they could not have done what they did without him. If you had just put people in a studio in front of a piano with all the equipment, they wouldn't have had a clue. But because of his facility with the equipment and his musical ear and ability, he's able to take germs of what they do, give it back, and help them develop it further. So we see young people expressing themselves. And um, my first reaction on seeing this, I, uh, I used to teach the works of Karl Marx, particularly the early 
racism of Marx. And it seemed to me a good example of Marx's idea of a non-alienated society where people produce goods in the world. They objectify themselves by producing goods in the world. Those goods confirm their individuality, but at the same time connect them with other people. And this is what I saw in the musical performance, the people expressing their individuality, but doing it in connection with other people. Um, so how is their expression made? Well, the, the song lyrics are very interesting. I've heard quite a, a lot of songs, many of them about loneliness, isolation, loss, despair, but also hope. Well, so people are expressing their experience through the lyrics but also through the music and the mood of the music. You, you can hear it, um, you know, the, the mood is also incredibly expressive. So um, I don't have a great, I don't have a grand thesis or a grand claim, but I just want to explore the idea that this program is a way in which two things can happen. First of all, people develop a type of autonomy through relations with others and through their expression. But also going back to the other theme of relational equality, one thing I didn't say, um, although it may be clear from other contributions, things I said, is that when I think about equality and relations of equality, I don't have in my head a utopian idea of what an egalitarian society would be. Rather, I turn it on its head. I'm much more interested in relations of inequality and how that manifests itself in the world. And it seems to me we can be very clear that there are unjust relations of social inequality in our world, even if we don't have a paradigm of a model of equality. And that our job as philosophers interested in policy is to think about, first of all, identifying these inequalities. Some of them are hidden. Um, and secondly, to think about how you know, within our own lifetimes we might be able to make some changes which mitigate some of the worst inequalities. So I see this program both as developing relational autonomy and micro steps, tiny, tiny steps in overcoming some of the social inequalities between people with minority minds and people uh, who have majority minds. And one way that this comes through is um, the admiration, almost envy, that the friends and family have for the people who are involved in this program. So th there was another, uh, there was a live um, performance, I'm not sure if it was recorded, but one of the participants in the program uh, had problems with alcohol and was in an alcohol recovery centre um, when the video with his work played and he was watching it with three or four friends in the alcohol recovery centre who had no idea about his musical ability. And just to see the looks on the faces of his friends uh, made them think about him differently once they'd, they'd seen this. So it made them rather envious of him. They admired him. And I think they maybe wanted to get him a, to know him a bit better and it would overcome some of that social isolation. So this program is a tiny program. It's small scale and you can see it's very labor intensive, but it seems to me it helps people develop the capacity for autonomy and also to develop um, an autonomous stream of action. Quite often when we think about autonomy, we think about autonomous choices. Um, I think that is slightly misleading because our life isn't really about choices, it's more about actions and processes. So I like to think more about autonomous sequences, autonomous sequences of, of events and um, it seems to me that this program will help people develop in their relational way an autonomous connecting sequence, even if it doesn't yet give people the resources to live an autonomous life. So I think my time is up and I will stop at this point. So thanks very much for your attention. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, we have a, a question from C Cecilia Mann. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, uh, she said it was absolutely beautiful. Does this program have a component where the public can listen to the recordings, like a podcast or online streaming access? Um, so the 
video I played is on YouTube, uh, and there's another one on YouTube as well. And they also have their own website um, where the at least half a dozen songs are available. And I think there's more and more coming online. Um, I'll put the links in the chat uh, later on. So yeah, so I'll, I'll give you access to that. But it is it is beautiful. This one is from Aner An Anerink Fiole. I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, when it comes to relational autonomy and relational equality, who is helping who in this case of musical therapy? You take on the perspective of the musical therapist helping and supporting the youth. How is the therapist also helped and supported to be able to be by these youth in this relational scheme? How is this autonomy constituted to through their through the relations and would comprehending that also contribute to the equality of this relational point? How was this come in your analytic frame? Okay, that is a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I was thinking of something um, you know, very similar this morning, actually, when I was thinking about it, because you know, listening to the other three days of the conference uh, it does turn your head around sometimes and makes you see things that maybe you hadn't seen before. And you know, there is a question about why did John give up his career as a successful music producer, making quite a lot of money to do this? And you know, it's not for me to tell John's own story, um, but I, I think that the idea that John himself is finding something in running this program is um, you know, a, a very valid point that his own autonomy maybe is being developed through, through this. Um, so let me, I, so I'm, I don't think I can answer this further, but um, <laughs> it's definitely a conversation I want to now have with John about how he sees his own autonomy as developed through this. I should say that um, from his own point of view, uh, he is thinking of it in terms of a more type of generic help rather than developing autonomy, that he's not a philosopher, um, he's a musician, but obviously very sensitive. And he thinks that he can just help people get better without there being a lot of um, theory about what that means. But I should say something which I touched on and didn't develop properly. So particularly when he's working with younger people, um, he's been working with mental health professionals uh, and uh, people who've been working in social work and mental health you know, for decades, for their lifetime. And one thing that they have picked up on is how for many disaffected younger people, services are themselves often seen as oppressive and leading to further problems. And so if you try to get someone to go to an appointment, you know, every hospital in the world looks the same, they're all scrubbed clean, so on with those pastel walls, you know, you're, you're clearly in an environment where you're there uh, because there's something wrong with you. And this is an oppressive environment. And you know, before they did the music therapy program, uh, one of the people that John works with, a man called Nick Barnes, worked with football teams. And they found that for, uh, at that time, it was all boys, I think, but now with, with the rise of women's football in this country, uh, maybe it would be possible for, uh, for girls as well. But for teenage boys, having a mental health program at a football club was fantastic because it was non-stigmatizing and non-oppressive. And the music therapy has the same function. It is doing something that other people are envious of and would like to get into that program. And that makes a lot of difference. And also, of course, it treats people in their own individuality rather than thinking there's some sort of generic approach that is going to help everyone. So I know that goes beyond the question, but um, sorry, it's just something I wanted to add and I hadn't managed to bring it in so far. Thank you, Jonathan. We also have a question from Amandine Catala. Uh, she says, um, thank you so much for this captivating talk. I wonder if you can say more about why some dislike the expression minority mind, which as I recall, was extending Elizabeth Barnes' expression of minority body. I like it and use it, though I have remained it by saying minoritized minds instead of minority mind 
following Shelley Tremaine's work on vulnerability and her phrase vulnerabilized rather than vulnerable. If there is time, I also wonder if you can expand on your suggestion that it is easier to publish on disability in mainstream philosophy journals. It seems to me that aside from a few exceptions that prove the rule, mainstream generalist philosophy journals are still mostly indifferent and sometimes even hostile to issues of disability. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So two fantastic questions there, and I, I think we have time. So I, I wonder, um, so I was very, very happy with the term minority minds, but I prefer the minoritized minds. So, so thank you so much for that. I will possibly use it. But um, it was actually Shelley who told me that some people had objected to the term minority body. And um, I had assumed it was because minority is used in different ways in philosophy, but I, I don't know, Shelley, whether you're able to come on and say a little bit more about that. Hi, I um, just um, uh, an APA I, which I, I wasn't at, I was told that um, uh, in an APA session, um, which was, devoted to um, the minority, a, a discussion of the minority body by Barnes, um, that uh, a, a Black disabled uh, philosopher had objected to um, the use of uh, the term minority body in that context. Um, I can't say very much more about that right. because I don't have many more details. Right. Um, I'm, so thank you, Shelley. So I, I think the problem is we're uncomfortable with any terminology here and, and ev everything is politicized and it's going to be very difficult. But I think, but I'd like the, I, but I want to have a generic term which isn't about cognitive disability because I think that is um, very unhelpful. So some notion of difference is, is important, but maybe there are better suggestions. But minoritized minds, I, th I think, is going to be my favorite. Okay, on the publishing. All right. So, um, so I first wrote a paper on my, my first paper on disability. I finished writing round about 2002, I think. And I, you know, being a, the type of political philosopher I am, I sent it to um, ethics and philosophy and public affairs and journal of political philosophy. I think um, the, the, I got a desk reject on the basis that uh, everything I was saying was unoriginal on the first one. It was trivial and unoriginal. Uh, without being told where what I was saying had already been said, um, because I would have liked to have known to have, re to have read, read it. And I was in a peculiar situation where an unpublished paper of mine was being used for teaching in some American departments, but I couldn't get it published. Um, and I tried other main journals. I just sort of gave up because I didn't want it published in an unknown journal. Um, so, so I lost interest. And then... Um, Kimberly Brownlee and Adam Curtin approached me knowing I had a paper and they had a, a collection coming up, the Disability and Disadvantage collection. So it went into that. Uh, and and you know, that was an invited chapter rather than a journal. The next paper I had on disability went into um, a special issue of economics and philosophy. I think not for the first time in my life, it was time when I've been part of a special issue where all the papers were invited but um, not all of the papers were actually published in the end in this case mine was published I've been on other type other invited journals where um you know I've written a paper for a conference sent it in and they've said no afterwards which is a very frustrating experience all around so that was a special edition and then the third one that I published was um published by Lycia and Eva, because it was part of the conference proceedings, it was first published in, um, I think it was Meta Philosophy. And again, that was a special issue. So I suppose what I, I suppose I, I'm coming around to agreeing with you that um, it's actually not easy to publish on spec. If you're just sending papers about disability into the main journals, it's pretty hard to get them published. Um, 
but if a special edition is made in advance, then that seems easier. I think the, the problem, I think part of it is that it doesn't engage with other things that are already in the journals very often. Or if it does, it distorts what you want to say. So if you're trying to do something different to what's already in the other journals, the journals don't know how to handle it. But I, I, I would still say, okay, so maybe I was wrong about saying to say journals are more receptive, but I am just seeing a lot more published on disability than I was before. And maybe it's books on disability and collections on disability. I don't know if others have experience about this. I'd be interested to hear what others have to say as well. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We also have a question from Francis Myerskopf, and they say, have you had a look at any music therapy literature? And how do you connect this with your own philosophical background? Okay. Asking as a music therapist who likes getting stuck into theory and interested hearing the view of someone coming from at this from a different direction. Okay, so so thank you for the question. So I have to confess here that I haven't got deeply stuck into the music therapy literature. I've read a couple of things. I've spoken to to music therapists, but um, I I'm the sort of person that works over many different things at the same time, and this is maybe not very admirable. But it, what what it means is that quite often I only dip into something and get stimulated by it before I go into it deeply so uh, I have to hold my hands up and say not nearly as much as I should be doing or, or have done but partly um, like others I was so impressed by the work that John Hall is doing I think it's so important and um, more people ought to get to know about it I almost used it instrumentally uh, to get it into this paper so at least some philosophers would hear about it and maybe want to talk about it and, and think about it but our long-term goal is just to get more funding into it so we can scale the programs up and so the more people that hear about it the better i'm interested as a music therapist are you doing similar things to this work francis i, I you can't answer me um but maybe, maybe you can put something in the chat to say what your experience is and whether this resonates with anything that you're doing yourself Oh, Francis, you're coming on. Yeah, apparently I can unmute myself. Isn't that exciting? Um, um, so you can hear me, but not see me. Great. Um, so yeah, what do I, um, I, I tend to use improvisation more in sessions with, with my, with my young people and don't, haven't done so much haven't done so much on the recording side myself, um, though I've got something, I've got something lined up with some adult groups that I run using recording, because um, um, I kind of co-run within the community a group for trans and non-binary people, and we've been talking about the way, kind of when you see someone from your community performing. Um, you're kind of not only reflecting on what it's like for them being on stage but also it's like you're seeing someone who's like you on stage so it's almost like there's that positive kind of impact on self for someone in the audience as well um yeah, yeah. But, um but generally um a lot of the stuff i do is tends to be about kind of being playful in the room and a lot of stuff about relationship, actually, yeah, with the with the young people I'm working with, quite a lot of kind of stuff where there's difficulties around attachment or trauma. Okay, fascinating. And I, I, I was talking to Axel before about our, uh, in my case, very fledgling and now non-existent music career. But I'm I'm an improviser by nature, and maybe also in giving talks, I'm a bit of an improviser. By nature and, and and like that playfulness but for people who've got a different background um the the discipline of writing a song and, and seeing it performed is quite amazing i've seen john do this just with you know the children of friends that you know he'll he'll have someone around and they'll go into the recording studio and half an hour later they've written a song together and so it's just uh, he has this natural way of working with people to bring things out. But something I, I was slightly nervous about when I, I, I did quite a bit of work on poverty. And one thing I like very much is in a book 
by the South African philosopher H.P. Uh, Lotti, I think his name is, sorry, I'm blanking on his name. But he, he says, people in poverty often lose the capacity to amuse and amaze people around them. And I thought this was really interesting. Do we ha is there a type of basic need almost to amuse and amaze people? Now, of course, you have to be very careful with this in the disability context because of the, uh, you know, the, the history of the way in which people with some disabilities have been misused over the years. But I think the, what the music therapy program that, that I was showing does, it really does show how people can amaze in a positive way those around them. But I also love this idea that um, people will identify it's almost like a role model. This is one of us doing, doing that. And I, I suppose it, it's an extension of things that happen just quite normally. So if, if there's a sports person from your country that achieves to a high degree in, in some area, you think you know, that shows that even you know, people like us can do that too. So uh, thank you, Francis. That's very interesting. Um, I just say, while you were talking, I found the link to Outsider Music. So John Hall's organization is called Outsider Music. And um, the link I've given is to some streams there. So six streams of songs. Then if you go to the higher level, you get the whole of the, uh, the whole of the site there. And I think there are more things being added to it. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank you so much, Nathan. It's 7.53. I don't think we have uh, time for another question. It's a shame I still have some questions. But uh, we, it's better, if, I think, if we finish now and we can keep talking while the, during the break. So please stick around. Thank you so much, Jonathan Wolf, again. And remember that we still have a whole day of more interesting talks. Thank you so much. <laughs>